mixed up a little bit. She could not quite understand how to come up with the, an answer. She was just a little bit off. The problem just not did not make sense to her. Now, sometimes I think we have a similar problem as this young lady. Sometimes our math, when we look at it, doesn't make sense to us compared to God's math. Right. Now, I just put something together a little bit. We talked last week, you know, the average household income in SkyTube is about 42000 So there's a picture I have up here that says our math. Now, I just threw some numbers randomly up here, you know, so they may not make perfect sense, but they give you an idea up here. Our math says this. I make $3,500 a month. That would be $42,000 a year. Uh, I have a $1,000 mortgage, $500 in utilities, $500 in food, $500 in car payment, $500 in insurance and gas, $500 debts and miscellaneous. That leaves how much left for ties? Zero. See, so often when we look at things through our math, we come up with the number zero or a number that's pretty small because we don't have much left at the end of the month. Now let's take a second look at God's map. God's map says this. We make the same amount of money. The first thing we should do is give our tithes. $350. Then we pay our bills. Our mortgage, our utility, our food, our car payment, our insurance, our gas, our debts. Now how much do we have left at the end? We're negative. So God wants us to be in the hole? Yes. No, no, no. What your understanding is, we're looking at things through our math, not through God's math. Right. See, God's math works a little bit differently than our math. We look at this and say, this is impossible. I can't continue to live in debt week after week, month after month. This can't be what God has for me, and it's not. Because God's math goes on beyond this. See, God's math says, you know what? It includes bonuses. It includes inheritances. It includes overtime, unforeseen discounts on things. It includes many blessings that we don't see or don't get if we don't begin with God's math. You know, God said, don't test me. He says, do not test the Lord thy God. We're not supposed to put him to the test except in one area, our gift. He said, in this one area, you can test me and see if I don't open the floodgates. And just see if I don't pour my blessings upon your life. Yeah. Church, see, too many of us are missing the blessings of God because we're not following his command. We're not understanding a simple principle. And that principle is depending on God. We've got to learn the principle of dependence. And it's not going to happen until we... Realize several little things. One thing, we have to realize that we talked about last week, that everything we have belongs to God. Secondly, we have to realize that if we're not depending on God, we're depending on ourselves. And can I tell you? It doesn't matter how good you think you are. You can't do it by yourself. Listen to a couple things. William A. Ward said this. Giving is more than a responsibility. It's a privilege. More than an act of obedience, it is evidence of our faith. Billy Graham, a name you should be familiar with, said this. You're rich if you have a meal today. You're right. You know, here in America, we're so overly blessed. We really are. You know, we get upset because one of our cars broke down. But we have two more in the driveway that work just fine. In some places in the world, they don't have a car. They barely have a house to live in. Sometimes they don't eat much at all. We are a blessed people. And we, we became so blessed because in our early days, we learned something. To depend and rely on God. Until we get that again, those blessings aren't going to fill. We aren't going to flow. We need to learn to depend on God. You ever had a time when nothing uh, added together? Nothing uh, uh, made sense? Where there was nothing you could do, you just had to put it completely in God's hands? Well, 
Can I tell you, I've been one of those guys all my life that can fix things. If something breaks down, you know, a DVD player, VCR, I take it apart, I fix it. My kids would always bring me their toys, something broke, they bring it to me so I could put it back together. You know, I've been good at fixing things. I even worked at a church and, and uh, I would go into some of the storage rooms and there'd be sticky notes on items and say, Vince, can you fix this? They just knew I'd come across it eventually. And, but I remember a particular time where I came across something that I couldn't fix. Y'all all know Eli, our middle child. He was born a few weeks premature. And as a result, his lungs weren't fully developed and he had to spend some time in the NICU. Now, as a parent, it's one of the hardest things for you to go through to see your child in a situation like that with tubes going in and there's nothing you can do about it. I couldn't fix him. I couldn't put them back together. There was nothing I could do. It was a time where the only thing I could do was just to trust and rely on God. Yes. And to put it in His hands. Church, God wants us to rely on Him, not just in the times that are so tough that we can't do it, but He wants us to rely on Him in the good times too. That's right. So those good times can be better. Church, we are such a blessed people. We, we stop relying on God and we begin to rely on ourselves. We stop relying on God's healing and we just rely on doctors. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with doctors. I go to doctors. But can I tell you? If you're sick, take it to God first. God can heal you before you even get to the doctor. Amen. Don't rely on the doctor. Rely on God. Now, God may use the doctor to bring healing. But still, it comes from God. We need to learn to rely on Him. The earliest use of the word tithe in Scripture was in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham paid a tenth or a tithe to Melchizedek. His tithe was a sign of his dependence on God and his gratitude for God's help in recent battles. You see, there were several cities and states that surrounded Abraham. Surrounded where he had settled. And all these cities and states had their own king. And one particular time, the Mesopotamia kings decided they were going to uh, start some trouble. They began going land after land, starting war. They began to go into these places and completely pillage them. They would defeat the armies. They would loot the cities. And they would take the people as their slaves. But... All this was happening all around Abraham, but none of it was touching him. He somehow managed to stay ahead of it all. God's blessing was on his life. So Abraham didn't get involved until something happened. See, Abraham had some family. And his family was living in one of these towns one of these kings came into. And they took this family as slaves. And Abraham said, not my family. <coughs> so he got 300 of his men together, and he set out to rescue his family. And he did rescue him. But he didn't only rescue his family, he took back the loot that they had stolen from so many other places. He took it back. But then, what we read about here in Genesis chapter 14, it describes his victory party. Melchizedek, he led the worship service, and Abraham understood something, that his existence and his survival depended on God. Now I have another little uh, offering testimony video we want to show you.